The house will be in order. Let us pray. We ask your blessing upon those who have worked so hard these past few days to help bring our nation to a level of security. Not a single member was ready on the other side to sit and talk to anyone on this aisle. Why don't you try working with Democrats? The American people want us to meet in the middle. They don't want this nonsense. Not all are completely satisfied. This Harry Reid plan offers no solutions to the broken Washington mess that got us here, so I'll vote no. This is an inside job. But help us all to proceed graciously. With the gentleman yield. The American people with the gentleman are looking yield. for real solutions. But the gentleman will not yield. Let me make my point and I'll be happy to be off. It's a perfect absurdity yield. and I will not yield to you. Remaining vigilant for those values held most dear while being just. Help each member to understand well and interpret positively as they are able the positions of those with whom they disagree. My friends across the aisle voted to rob $500 billion out of Medicare for Obamacare. What kind of world do you people live in? Grant to each the wisdom of Solomon and to us all the faith and confidence to know that no matter how difficult things appear to be, and we will, use, the gentleman will suspend. You continue to walk with our nation as you have done for over two centuries. I hope for once, that once we get past today, that we will not in any way General yield again expired. to the voices of 87 members who care nothing General about Lady's America. They simply care about their way or the highway. General Lady's time I am upset, and Gentleman we should not do this Speaker, anymore. Thank you very much. It is time for real adults to control this Congress, and they need to control this Congress now. As God is my witness, we will not compromise on our principles. How did it get so bad? How did America become so divisive, so dysfunctional? The American system of government is set up for debate and compromise, but with no one compromising, the American system of government is bound to fail. How did we get here? How do we get out? Communists and socialists. Somebody ought to investigate. On this day, we gather because we have chosen hope over fear. Yeah! Why do you continue to support a Nazi policy as Obama has? The time has come to set aside childish things. The time has come to reaffirm our new spirit. can't run anything effectively, and to think that they can run health care is smoking the funny stuff. This whole Obama administration is unconstitutional. This is another step in the total takeover of our society. Near the end of 2008, much of the United States was looking to change the political direction. Obama! Barack Obama represented the kind of change these voters craved. <laughs> Leading up to the 2008 election, the United States was engaged in two wars, paid for with borrowed money and the country was stuck in a deep recession. Starting today, we must pick ourselves up, dust ourselves off, and begin again the work of remaking America. We are ready to lead once more. 
Obama called for a change in American government, ran on the premise of hope. He called on Americans to change their direction. That call went unanswered. Instead, he got a country whose divisions have grown deeper after his inauguration. The optimism from this day would be forgotten. The Democrats care more about doing harm to their political adversaries for the sake than doing of their good political for the middle class America. Which is to have Probably this president fail. It's not what the people said they wanted done on November 2nd. Willing to put this whopping hole in the deficit for tax breaks for the millionaires and billionaires don't come to us. What are we thinking? From Congress to cable news, the anger is filtered through partisan media and the president becomes the target. This president has had two years. He has, he has given us $3 trillion in debt. If we look at real unemployment, it's 17% of people that want jobs out there that can't find the work they want. The president's report is released. We're right on track to achieve our goals in Vietnam. Afghanistan, sorry, sorry. Afghanistan, not Vietnam. Have, have you ever seen flies, so many flies, yeah. land on the face of the president? If you went into these negotiations with Republicans not wanting cheese on the pizza, you ended up ordering extra cheese for the pizza. So it's perceived that you are a big fan of the president. All right. How's President Obama doing so far? Give me your wallet. No. Well, just give me your money. Okay. See? Compromise. Hey, they need you in Washington, bub. He got everything passed, and guess what? Like every other time, socialism has been uh, tried, it's failed. He's a failure. We're in big trouble, and we are. the reason we're in big trouble is because things don't work. And I'm not, I'm not saying things don't work because Republicans just did well in November of 2010, because they didn't work so well in November 2006 when the Democrats did really well. It's what happens is that people don't talk to each other, they talk at each other. These last couple of years are the, are the worst and the nastiest and the meanest that I can remember in the 41 years I've been in Washington. I just don't remember another time like this. Uh, I've seen the deterioration of it, not just during this time, but it's, uh, it's saddening and it's disappointing to see. People don't want to yield, and in today's politics, a lot of these issues have taken on sort of an ide ideological wrapping. The political parties are as badly divided from each other as they have been since the 1890s. That's more than 100 years ago. I've come to the sad conclusion that um, human beings are tribal. Um, and we develop these tribal orthodoxies, and anybody who tries to see what another tribe might be seeing is seen as unfaithful to their own tribe, and they get whacked. There's something about this period now, and partly it's because of the cultural differences in society and the disagreements about basic right and wrong morality, not simply politics. So in a way, there's a, a division in American society that is hard to see that can be healed, in my judgment, by political action. America is a milk cow with 310 million tits. There's not a person in this country not getting something from a thing called government. State, local, municipal, federal, and bitching about that government as if it were an enemy. America is very polarized. Americans are very antsy, and some are quite angry. And it has a lot to do with unrealistic expectations and the need for immediate gratification. Other than health, for you and your family, what are the three things that frighten you the most? Loss of job, loss of house, and loss of savings. And many Americans have lost all of that. For many Americans, the future is not brighter than the past. 
we used to be a very optimistic society. We always used to think that our children will live a better life than we live. A lot of people don't think that anymore. They don't know how to cope with this. So they displace their hostility on the people who have made promises and the people who are supposed to perform. We've, we've become truncated. Uh, I hate to use the word selfish, but uh, there is. I've used the phrase, uh, we're not the greatest generation, we're the greediest generation. Uh, we have become a... Um a very impatient society, among other things. I mean, we're a nation of fast food. Uh, we're, we're a nation of instant gratification. And when you have someone like Barack Obama who comes along and says, we can change things, somehow people expect him to change in, in 20 minutes. And then uh, we're so, so impatient, it's almost like the queen of hearts. Uh, he's there 20 minutes and things didn't change, so off with his head. I can't believe this country would elect someone so anti-progress and pride of America. I don't think he believes in our country. I don't think he ever did. Barack Obama has done nothing but separate this country and cause blacks and whites against each other, and that's not fair. And how's, how's he done that? How's that? A long list of things. Okay, you have to read his books because it's in there. His dad has a deep-seated hatred against uh, against white people. We don't want this uh, to become another mecca. I don't think he's even a um, legalized citizen. Yeah. I learned all I needed to know about Islam on 9/11. The divide between party lines has grown deeper and wider over the past three decades. An ideological conservative base on the far right and a hardline liberal base on the far left pulls members of the House and Senate away from the center and away from compromise. Members who are open to compromise are often pressured to stick to their base. There is a huge feeling of anger and frustration, in fact, disgust what goes on here in Washington. Well, all we have is a partisanship problem, and that is it's loyal. You have people who get elected who are loyal to their parties to an extent that when they are making decisions about public policy issues, they're, they're thinking uppermost at first, you know, how does this affect my political party? Is this good for we, we Republicans? Is it good for the Democrats? You know, is it going to help us win the next election? And, and that's the problem because you, you, the people who are in office now uh, are looking over their shoulders about not the nation, but about the next primary, party primary. Congress is not even being minimally competent today. So uh, our behavior is shameful in many, many respects. We've got to cure this problem. We have allowed the partisan divide in the Congress to bring our action almost to a screeching halt. If it's bad policy, there's going to be no compromise. We're not living up to the better angels of our nature. We're listening to the, some of the worst influences. We're not going to be able to move forward as a country working together unless we all decide that this is something that we want to focus on. It is just going to be uh, um, uh, a struggle because we're not going, Republicans are not going to vote for a bill that it comes down that kills jobs. If you have a standoff where no one is willing to budge on their absolutely, in many instances, absurd views, then the person who is holding on to their beliefs truly out of sincere values is not going to budge. With respect to ideals, let's not, uh, let's not kid ourselves. Frequently they will unite us, but occasionally they'll divide us. The divide hit a low point when President Obama addressed Congress. In a special joint session over health care reform, South Carolina Congressman Joe Wilson broke decorum by heckling the president. The reforms, the reforms I'm proposing would not apply to those who are here illegal. It's not true. We have a Congress that basically now, in my view, is just simply dysfunctional. It just doesn't work. It, it can't, it can't, attack head-on the main 
issues and the main problems of facing the country. It just sort of has to nibble around the edges. You know, when I came to Washington in 1969, <clears throat> you still had Democrats and Republicans. You'd invite them over over to dinner. You don't really do that much anymore because they just don't like to be around each other much anymore. They, they feel uncomfortable. So what you have is this group of strangers. And since they don't know one another, it's an entirely different argument than when most of them lived here, when their children went to school here. Uh, they knew one another. I mean, it's always been a partisan place, but they knew one another. And you'd have these wonderful friendships that would develop across the aisle uh, after work. Once you've had a beer with somebody or been over to somebody's house for dinner, it's harder the next day to call that person a name and completely disparage their patriotism or their belief in American values. That is diminished when you've got people who are here two, three days a week and view this as kind of the, the gladiator spectacle. These days, friendships are harder to find on the Hill. And strangers are a lot easier to demonize than friends. Throughout American history, there have been deep divisions between political ideas of American democracy. The Civil War, labor laws, women's suffrage, civil rights. But the current political dysfunction can be traced as far back as 1964. Republican conservative Barry Goldwater lost his bid for president. But Goldwater's presidential run planted a seed that would start to grow slowly over the next four decades. In 1979, a freshman Republican from Georgia named Newt Gingrich walked into the House of Representatives. It was also the first year C-SPAN began broadcasting House and Senate sessions around the clock. Gingrich saw an opportunity to speak directly to the country, right through the TV cameras. This House is being irresponsible the Liberal Democrats in particular being irresponsible in that they are cheerfully spending their children and their grandchildren's money, that we are in effect guaranteeing that everybody who was born after 1940 or so is going to pay bigger and bigger bills, they're going to pay more and more interest rate, higher and higher taxes, and that their future is going to be grimmer because nobody who's in leadership in this House has the courage to say no and has the courage to set limits. For 40 years, Republicans held the minority in the House, having to compromise with Northern Democrats and Southern Democrats in order to advance their agenda. Gingrich came into office to change the game. He wanted the Republicans to stand alone, taking a deliberately conservative stance in Congress. If we pass this budget, we will tell the money markets to raise interest rates because the gentlemen from Mississippi's amendments have gutted the budget process. Gingrich abandoned the center, pushing for permanent control and creating a wedge between Republicans and Democrats. It advanced his political career, it advanced his party's uh, image of, it, of itself, and they saw themselves as, you know, warriors on Capitol Hill. The nation and the economy may well collapse if in a moment of panic and desire to avoid working next week, we adopt a high tax, high inflation, high interest rate, big bankruptcy, pork barrel budget. Both political parties can blow the whistle and say, we're on the road to ruin, which we are, by the way. If we keep on going down this road, uh, we will lose our economic preeminence within a generation. We may very well be fiscally ruined as a country. Our bill. That's right. we need to go to work. The anger has been building for a long time. They are using you. Americans have gotten a lot of bad news over the past decade, and money has played a dominant role in that bad news. America's urgent financial crisis has roots from a decade earlier. By 2001, the internet industry bubble had burst, leaving a large exit wound in the American economy. Still, the United States government had a $128 billion surplus when George W. Bush took office. In 2001, the U.S. economy continued to slip, and unemployment increased. In response, President Bush signed tax cuts into law, giving the average American roughly $600 more in their pocket 
It's estimated that this decision cut federal revenue by $1.8 trillion over 10 years. September 11, 2001. Al-Qaeda terrorists attack the U.S. In a swift response, America declared war on terrorism at a cost of almost $21 billion. In March 2003, President Bush declared war on Iraq at an initial cost of $87 billion. In the years that followed, the U.S. housing market imploded from underhanded loan practices that came to be known as credit default swaps. This created a domino effect. America's banking industry almost collapsed from funding those bad loans. Almost simultaneously, American auto manufacturers faced bankruptcy without money from the federal government. On the premise that the auto manufacturers and the banking industry were too big to fail, an auto manufacturer's bailout cost America $17.4 billion. The bank bailout cost Americans another $87 billion. The two wars on terror were several years in, and by this time, cost Americans roughly $1.1 trillion. President Barack Obama took office in January 2009 and signed the American Recovery Act into law almost immediately. The effort to stimulate the economy cost Americans $787 billion, all with no extra tax base to support this unprecedented spending. Where did all the money come from? Mostly, it was borrowed from China, and still is today. Uh, we never had a war in our history. We didn't have a tax to support it, including the revolution and Vietnam and Korea and this and that and that. And so here we are fighting two wars with no tax to sustain them. And, and for every dollar we spend, 41 cents is borrowed. Not from your favorite Uncle Charlie, who might give you a little leeway you know, and say, oh, you just don't have to pay the interest this year. No, it's borrowed mostly from a, a country that wants to be number one and make us number two. With the national debt well on its way to the $13 trillion mark, President Obama appointed former Senator Alan Simpson and former Clinton White House Chief of Staff Erskine Bowles to co-chair a special commission to find ways to help balance the country's books. This is going to require people of both parties to come together and take a hard look at the growing gap between what the government spends and what the government raises in revenue. And it will require that we put politics aside that we think more about the next generation than the next election. There's simply no other way to do it. The first few meetings uh, of somebody said, well, you know, we wouldn't be in here. Guess who the biggest spending president is in the history of the United States of America? Answer, George W. Bush. Well, yeah, but who was the biggest one triple, you know, quadruple plus him? That's this guy. We just finally said, we're not going to just sit here and listen to any more of this crap. We're going to get to the issue, what it, where is the United States located right now with debt, deficit, and interest? Because it's on a perilous, unsustainable, unconscionable, and totally predictable course. And everybody sobered up, and it took us another few months to establish trust. The commission was made up of Republicans, Democrats, and independent members of Congress, as well as business leaders from the private sector. After almost a year of work, the Bipartisan Commission came up with a comprehensive list of recommendations that included a combination of spending cuts and an end to tax breaks for America's wealthiest. We are running out of time to deal with our fiscal crisis, and uh, the growth of our debt is literally threatening the American dream. Uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff has said that it's the greatest threat to our national security. And the fact that our debt is no longer able to be ignored is what caused the debt ceiling extension to become such a critical battleground at this point. I'm confronted with these realities every day. And I think that's why the work of the commission was important, the fiscal commission that laid out a blueprint to get the deficits and debt under control. And the fact that 11 of the 18 came together, five Democrats, five Republicans, and one independent, is an indication of what can happen in a positive way. The commission's results were published, but were overall ignored by hardliners on the left and the right in the debt ceiling debate. The American people are going to find out who the bullshitters are and who the 
who the show horses are and who the work horses are. The truth of the matter is, the only people who are cutting $500 billion from Medicare are the Democrats in their proposal. Just to be very clear, what we did was eliminated the overpayments to some of the Medicare Advantage plans and, and hey, listen, hey, Madam, Madam Speaker. In that fray will be some great thoughtful Democrats and Republicans uh, who know what's happening and uh, have the guts to say it. Both parties got us in this mess. Both parties are going to have to work together to get us out of this mess. We've thrown a stink bomb into the garden party and let her rip. Uh, it, it won't go away. Quite frankly, we are drifting closer and closer to the falls. The ideological and political differences are so great, the Democrats aren't going to take a lot of cuts in their social programs and Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and Republicans aren't going to cut defense, and you can't cut interest on the debt. So I don't see, I don't see us getting out of it soon, and the question is, how long will the markets, in effect, bond markets and things like that, wait before they say the Americans aren't going to pay back their debts? A CBS poll shows that 72% of Americans in the survey believe Republican members of Congress should make trade-offs in order to solve problems. The same poll showed that 78% believe the president should be willing to compromise. But members of Congress are not hearing from the middle. I'm somebody who's in the middle. I want to reach across the aisle and work together. And politically, you get no benefit out of that because the people who participate in the process are on the extremes. Most people in the country don't think about politics on a daily basis. They live their lives. They go to church on Sunday, they go to work, they watch football, whatever it might be that they're worried about raising their kids. But the people who call your office, the people who are politically active, who knock on doors, who carry signs and parades for you, they're the activists. And the problem with that is it's the people in the middle that are getting frustrated with the fact that there's such division in the country. The most active citizens who tended to be the most ideological control the process and pull their representatives to the left or the right depending on the orientation of the district. Let me give you an example. I get letters every day from people who have read something on the internet that they take as gospel. They've done nothing to check it out. They've done nothing to reality test what they're hearing. They just get something on the internet that says some far out, crazy, wacko thing. And then they send you a letter as though this were gospel because it was on the internet. You know, I mean, people have got to be a little more skeptical. The internet has opened a gateway to a never ending flood of information. It's also made the distribution of that information expand beyond traditional news sources. Websites with an agenda and strong opinions are often built and presented in a way to look similar to a traditional news website, mimicking their style and appearance. This can give some users the impression that these opinion websites are traditional news websites, but the content is much different, biased and based on opinion rather than fact. That bias is amplified on some social media groups. The swapping of information is easy and immediate. Social media groups sometimes bring out raw and often offensive commentary. While social media proves to be a popular way to trade information, it also poses dangers in forming public opinion. There are no rules for fact-checking or sourcing information. Anything goes. Anyone can say anything and connect with others who feel the same way. Combined, opinions that pass as fact can spread almost instantly and can change the course of public debate. And what about the traditional media? If you want your news delivered from a conservative point of view, you can get it delivered from a conservative point of view. Republicans take to the floor to give the House a constitutional refresher, but Democrats call the act, quote, total nonsense. If you want a liberal view, you can find somebody to give it to you that way. 
On their first full day in power, House Republicans read the Constitution aloud and took less than one day to violate it. It's like going into a, a restaurant now and, and ordering eggs. You can get them sunny side up, scramble with a little jalapeno pepper. It's just however you want them, you can get it. But the result of that is we're no longer all getting the same stuff. We no longer all have the same database. I don't hear, I don't hear people saying, I, I need the facts to make a judgment on. So I think somebody has to come to the conclusion that they have to offer facts. In the old days, the thought of Walter Cronkite, for example, going on the air with a rumor, just you know, inexplicable, uh, um, unfathomable. The biggest thing I think we need to be aware of today is that uh, we do get news and information from people whose goal is not objectivity. In fact, it's probably just the opposite. They have a point of view or a cause to support, and that, that's going to filter the news and information we get from them. I think it's kind of redefined our, our whole idea of what is objectivity. Uh, to many people now, objectivity is simply whatever agrees with their point of view, and that's objective, and everything else is biased. Uh, yeah, gather around, guys. Move. Yeah. I know some of you have done a lot of this. Us. All right, so here's what's going on. You're working the morning news uh, at Channel 8, and you've concocted some bogus live shot, and all of a sudden there's some real news. Kent Collins is the chairman of the Broadcast Journalism Department at the University of Missouri. Mizzou is the oldest journalism school in the country and has a long tradition for turning out many of the country's top broadcast journalists. Tomorrow's network anchors, reporters, and executives are likely to come from here. The importance of objectivity is a key principle taught to all journalism students. Producing a news broadcast, a digest of today's news events around the world, was a very expensive proposition. Now, for relatively little money, I can get a news set, news graphics, news-looking anchors, and I can regurgitate news that's already uh, been reported. You look at some of these well-known programs on the cable stations, they don't do any reporting. There's no original content there. They're taking material, information, that was developed earlier by the regular news purveyors, and they are talking about it. So it's entertainment, or commentary if you want to give it a better name, it's entertainment about stuff that somebody else has done all the legwork and all the expensive reporting to do. That's a huge difference, and I think the public uh, often is, is confused by this. So we're looking at two cable television shows about the news of the day, and they're vastly different. They're talking about the same story, they're talking about the same event of the day, but they present it differently. This is Fox. And it is a new day in our nation's capital. Republicans took control. The setting is like a traditional newscast, and it surprises or confuses some Americans, apparently. Looks like an anchorman, dressed like an anchorman. We have news graphics, a news set that we'll see later in the presentation. All of this looks like a traditional newscast. It has the trappings, but it's not a news cast. It's a show, an entertainment show about news. Control of the House of Representatives earlier today as the 112th Congress was officially sworn in. Now for the American people that means a return to two-party government. The suggestion was that in the previous Congress we didn't have two-party government. That's just not true. And as the anointed one might say, that is change we can believe in. The reference to President Obama as the anointed one is so much commentary as to be a senseless insult. It doesn't help the delivery of story information. Now, the highlight of today's event came as the San Francisco Speaker relinquished her power to the new Speaker of the House, Ohio Congressman John Boehner. Now, that is certainly a breath of fresh air after two years of Democratic power grabs. Breath of fresh air, as suggested by Mr. Hannity, that's certainly a subjective comment, and power grab is the same kind of phrase. Now we're going to look at the same story on MSNBC, which has been acknowledged to have a very liberal slant. But keep in mind, it's the same news of the day. It's just a way to make entertainment out of the subject matter that differs. Good evening from New York. This is Wednesday, January 5th, 671 days until the 2012 presidential election. And it's morning sickness in America. Totally subjective, totally opinionated, used to inject a certain emotion or concept in the minds of the viewers. 
The one night stand against Congress in November resulting in a brand new Speaker of the House in January. Congressman John Hankey Please Boehner. The description of Hankey Please uh, oh, yes. refers to Boehner's inclination to get emotional and sometimes shed a few tears, but it uh, suggests that he's maybe weak, maybe too sensitive. The graphic lead him and weep. The picture uh, has an expression on his face that maybe doesn't look uh, confident. In our fifth story, a headache for the diminished Democrats, but also for the emboldened Republicans already breaking their Tea Party promises. Welcome to the 112th Congress, Discount House of Worship and Flea Circus. The reference to Discount House of Worship and Flea Circus is an insulting reference. Uh, it's uh, loaded, loaded with subjectivity. Mr. Boehner of Ohio became the 53rd Speaker of the House, describing this day as a time of great challenges. Once again, uh, making fun of, uh, making humor out of uh, Mr. Boehner's uh, inclination to uh, cry and show a little bit of emotion at big emotional events. Same news story, two different presentations, and not newscasts. These are not newscasts. These are entertainment shows. These are commentary shows. The media has become like a buffet restaurant. When you go into that buffet restaurant, mm, there's salad over here, there are vegetables over here, but there's a lot of greasy meat and good, uh, good dessert over here. And we're tempted by the easy and the fun and the sweet stuff. And so we take what we like, not what we need. We take what's easy, which includes opinions, it's easy to accept somebody else's opinion if it's in the ballpark with my own. and It's reinforced by a good-looking faux anchor man on the uh, a faux news set. A zealot or a hundred percenter is a person you want to stay away from. They've got gas, ulcers, BO, heartburn, shingles. I mean, they're on fire. Kids looking at and, it. And they try to take people with them. Well, I'll call time out right away. And they make millions off of green pea people who listen to their crap and get all worked up. They are nothing more than entertainers and they are glorious at it. They should each have a medal of freedom as an entertainer, but don't give me crap about what the government ought to do on either side. They're, they're vapor heads. And I think it's added to the partisanship. Yeah, absolutely it's dangerous for the country because that stresses the social fabric. Although I am a proud and vigorous supporter of the First Amendment, uh, I am saddened and offended by the interpretation of this institution as one that cannot achieve anything, that is conflicted and fighting, uh, that we are, as I said, uh, fodder for talk show hosts. I mean, I think it's very dangerous, and I think it's very short-sighted, uh, but a lot of people, that's, that's how they want it. They always say that, you know, moderates are like, you know, those in the middle are the, the, the animals that get killed in the middle of the road. It's the moderates who seem to take the hit because you see the rise of people on the, on, on the left and the right who are the most strident voices and the loudest voices and the angriest voices. The talk was unconstitutional. The order was unconstitutional. That's right. The banks was unconstitutional. Have you read the Constitution? Then why did you vote for these unconstitutional bills? Because you are a part That's exactly right. Bob Inglis was one of South Carolina's congressmen for 12 years. Inglis was one of the most conservative members of Congress, but he wasn't conservative enough for the Tea Party. I mean, I, I knew I was in trouble uh, in, in the August uh, 09 town hall meetings about health care, that um, you, know, you can't have 700 people show up, most of them mad at you about health care, even though I was opposed to the health care package. But I wasn't, what I wasn't willing to do is to um, hate the president, you know, and I, I guess I made the terrible political mistake of saying, what's there to hate? Well, what happened was this, you know, it's, it's a raucous town hall meeting. There's, we had 13 town hall meetings in August 2009. Um, you know, where we'd normally have uh, 32 people, we had 350 people. The largest one was 700 people. Um, at one of them, um, 
you know, uh, the, the crowd had become sort of uh, well, pretty agitated with me. I wanted to talk about solutions. I wanted to spend five minutes saying that I was opposed to the president's package, the Democrats' package, and an hour and 25 minutes talking about what we could do in health care. Well, I knew then, and I certainly know now, that I should have reversed that, that I should have spent five hours or five minutes saying what we could do and an hour and 25 minutes um, trashing the president. That would have worked. Here's a suggestion up here. The suggestion to watch Glenn Beck. Here's what I'd suggest. Turn on the national television off when he comes. I said, well, what are you afraid of? And she said, well, watch Glenn Beck and you'll know. And so I said, well, I got a suggestion for you. <laughs> if he scares you, turn him off. <laughs> I was a pretty practical suggestion, you know. I didn't want her to lose sleep at night. Um, because, you know, really, I think it's a real shame when people play on other people's fears to drive their ratings. In the end, Bob Inglis never made it to the general election. He was defeated in his own primary. Never before has money so strongly influenced political and ideological messages. Money is at the core of polarization and hyperpartisanship. And the interests pushing those messages have very deep pockets. We have professionalized what used to be an amateur sport. It's a sickness. It's a sickness. They have a formidable challenge in the campaign process. It is a tremendous burden to run for office in this country, the kind of money that has to be raised. All those people that used to advise for free, you know, we have turned over all those jobs to these professional consultants, uh, these gurus, these uh, commercial makers, these uh, consultants, all of these people that do this for money. Let's say you go to the Goat Ropers Association and you say, you know, I, I just want you to know that if any issues that the Goat Ropers have uh, come up in Congress, I'm going to give it my very best uh, thought. I'll study it and uh, I'll, I'll uh, try to help you where I can. If you go to somebody like the Goat Ropers, uh, if there is such an association, and and say that, you're not going to raise a dime. Now you have to go to the Goat Ropers Association and say, folks, I'm your guy. Whatever comes up, I'm your guy. I'm the guy that will do it for you. I will take your position every time. Now, if you do that, you can raise, you know, whatever you can raise from the Goat Ropers. And then you go to somebody else, and you have to say the same thing. But you you have to relinquish Good judgment. It's unspoken when you're meeting with a contributor or, or a company that has the ability to fund negative ads in your district. They'll t tell you their point of view, and they're not going to say, if you disagree with me, I'm going to go into your district and fund the other candidate. But it's unspoken. It hangs over the conversation in a way that it wasn't before. When you're running for office, your friends are going to help you, and your non-friends are going to help your opponent. That's fine. I mean, we all know, you know, I'm a Democrat, you know, the labor unions and them pretty much would support me and the business community is going to support my opponent. I understand all that. But when you see valid amendments that just make perfect common sense, be stripped out of legislation, and then you usually ask, okay, why? And if you look closely, you might find a recent fundraiser put on for the speaker or for someone else at the time. And that's just a little bit of thank you payback. Uh, it's, it's not, I don't want to make it like really, it's not always really direct, let's say like, hey, if you do a fundraiser for me, I'll take this minute. That's It's not the way it goes. But I mean, there's winks and nods go on and fundraisers are had and money is being raised. Here today, the special interest, I believe, if a member of Congress would be honest, they would admit that it is overwhelming, it's burdensome, and it's unfair to this process, and it takes away from the deliberative process that is so necessary to generate good law. The pressure for re-election is compounded by the cost of campaigning. 
The average cost of a candidate running for the House of Representatives is over $1 million. For a senator, the number is over $4 million and has gone as high as $150 million. The money's gotten out of control. And when I ran my first race, it was maybe, I think we raised maybe 180000 My last couple of races, you know, I could raise a million dollars if I wanted to. When I raised money for my campaign, I didn't want to raise it. I hated raising money. But this is what the television stations charged. And if you wanted to get your message out, you, so if you could get around those parts that cost so much, you could drive a lot of the money out because nobody wants to have to raise money. It now costs so much money to get elected that you have to sign off with so many interest groups that by the time you get here, your positions are set in stone. You can't compromise. And in this age of the internet and the blogs and all of that, if you deviate this much off your position, uh, you're gonna get hammered. Money below the surface has always played a significant role in modern American politics. But political funding has historically had limits. In January 2010, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in favor of allowing corporations to donate unlimited money indirectly to either support or oppose a campaign. The case, known as Citizens United, has now distorted the political process, stripping away limits on political spending and essentially giving corporations the same rights as people. A report issued by the Centers for Responsive Politics show that the average spending for midterm elections is around $1 billion. Following the Supreme Court decision, the 2010 midterm elections quickly became the most expensive midterm elections in the country's history at $4 billion. I will get hell for this. The Supreme Court of the United States making a decision that a corporation is like a person to give money, even now anonymously, to get into campaign? Madness. And just one large company's quarterly earnings could buy the entire American political process if they unleashed that financial power. How dangerous is Citizens United? You, do, you can run any kind of ad you want under any kind of patriotic name you want, and no one knows who's paid for that ad. I mean, if there's a place where money is going to corrupt campaigns, Citizens United decision did it. We are near the breaking point. Maybe we won't be crushed when our economy snaps, but someone will. It's time to take away President Obama's blank check. I'm particularly worried about the Citizens United Supreme Court case because that could allow corporations essentially to run America. And this is supposed to be government of the people, by the people, for the people, not of the corporation, by the corporation, and for the corporation. Because of the Supreme Court decision that we had that allows, uh, equates money to free speech and allows corporations to fund advertisements, you do run into the problem with them going into districts and spending, in some cases, millions of dollars to de defeat legislators who were relatively popular in their own districts until these outsiders come in. The ideologues who can't accept any level of conversation or other common ground. And that's really, I think, what the dangerous place is. It's a win-at-all-cost attitude. And if it's a win-at-all-cost attitude for anyone, it really ought to be for their constituents, but frequently, it's for someone else. His business? Helping companies send our jobs to countries like China. Now, Congress wants to strip us bare. Pearl Mutter voted for a spending bill that helped send jobs overseas. In the aftermath of the Citizens United decision, more money is now being spent on political campaigns than ever before. Reckless spending has become a habit. Controlling the message is the key to success. Fimian lied, his record built upon a fraud. In these commercials, the candidates themselves have no control over the attack ads that are being produced. If all you knew about our politics, it's what you learned from television commercials. You know, you would think that the people who run for office are thieves, uh, deviates, uh, just the worst people in our society would be the only ones that you would know that ran for office. Well, the fact is there's some good people that run for office, but you'd never know it from these television commercials. Connolly loaded our kids up with nearly $800 billion in wasteful stimulus spending, then added nearly a trillion more for Pelosi's health care takeover, a debt of $14 trillion. Now Congress wants to pile on more spending. How much more can our children take? Call Congressman Connolly. 
Tell them vote to cut spending this November. It's just too much. The American Action Network is responsible for the content of this advertising. Have another look at this political commercial. Pay close attention to the disclaimer in the small type that comes up at the end. Notice that the sponsor of the commercial is not the candidate, but a third party organization. And notice that the commercial is not authorized by any candidate. This commercial was produced by the American Action Network, one of a handful of new organizations producing commercials and other media in the new political landscape. The company is a clearinghouse for political attack ads all over the country. We send tax money to Washington, and what does Russ Feingold do with it? $800 billion for the jobless stimulus. Organizations like these feed off their ideological basis on both sides of the aisle. The American Action Network produces commercials promoting right-leaning interests. On the left, MoveOn.org does the same thing, criticizing the right with left-leaning attack ads. Don't let George Bush toss America's future into the trash. Under Citizens United, neither organization has to disclose how much funding they get or where their funding comes from. Adding to the political advertising machine, the Democratic Party has its own commercial producing organization. The Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee is responsible for the content of this advertising. The Republicans have their own organization as well. The National Republican Senatorial Committee is responsible for the content of this advertising. Almost always, the commercials produced are to discredit the opposition rather than promote their own candidates' views. Of course, the candidates themselves spend millions on commercial airtime. I'm running for Congress to fight for us to stop an out-of-control, intrusive government that strangles small business. Conveying their ideas in 30 seconds is challenging and is sometimes questionable in authenticity. Ed Perlmutter is different. Hi, what's on your mind? You just got to hope that the people have, you know, BS detectors and can eliminate half of it. Anybody who's got half a brain knows what <clears throat> bullshit is. You can identify it in a minute. Uh, it's, you, you get it here first. Not up here. You, you're looking and the guy looks so sincere, telling you that he's saving you, fighting, fighting for you. You like this, you know, passion fighting for you. Violin music in the background. And you know what? They hurt us. And yet, they ignored us. And folks, on November 2nd, they will ignore us no more. I'm Ken Buck, and I approve this message. Just holler, bullshit, and let it ring through the land. That can be our credo. We may make it if we can do that, because everybody of any sense or status in life knows what bullshit is. On the Hill, it's a new day, as a new Congress is sworn in. There is a new air of confidence from a large freshman class of young Republicans, many with strong Tea Party influence. Democrats and Republicans claim they both want compromise. It's the definition of compromise they may not agree on. You first you have to define what is meant by compromise. Uh, if, if someone infers from uh, mention of compromise that you're going to ever be compromising principle, uh, I'm not in favor of it. But if instead you have uh, two people who don't always see eye to eye working hard to s seek common ground on a series of issues, I'm for it. Uh, and that's what the American people want. That's what uh, Republicans and Democrats want. That's what I heard throughout the campaign uh, over the last couple of years. I'm in a vigorous public debate. And it is up to me to attempt to convey to the people whom I represent uh, the issues that are before them, to hear their input, and to do my absolute best to represent those views on good public policy for my district, my state, and my nation. We will certainly uh, hold the toes of the Republicans to the fire if they try to do things that are uh, damaging to our country and to the American people. On his first day as House Speaker, John Boehner makes his priority clear. It is no surprise to you and it should be no surprise uh, to our Democrat colleagues or to the American people that we want to repeal the health care law. This is a job killing bill that is in the way. There is uncertainty on how long the good intentions of compromise will last.
I think you got to hear the roar of the falls dead ahead before you get action. And I hate to say this, but I almost think that something terribly horrific has to happen, either psychologically or financially or whatever, uh, for the American people to say uh, this politics as usual can't go on the way it's been going on. 911, we are have confirmed reports that Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords, you see her there up on the screen, a Democrat of Tucson, has been shot outside an event at a Tucson supermarket. I can in confirm fact, that she was uh, shot in the head. The Congress and the country are frozen, shaken by the shooting of Congresswoman Gabby Giffords. Giffords is a symbol for compromise and civility in the House. The assassination attempt leaves a profound mark on the country, but it does not last. When the, the rhetoric about hatred about mistrust of government, about paranoia of how government operates, uh, and to try to inflame the public on a daily basis, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, has impact on people, especially who are unbalanced personalities to begin with. Murder in Arizona and the gross exploitation of it. Clarence Dupnik is on uh, the path here of attempting now to expressly, personally associate me with this event. March of last year, Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords, who was shot this week and reacted to Palin's map. Let's listen. We're on Sarah Palin's targeted list, but the thing is that the way that she has it depicted has the crosshairs of a gun sight over our district. And when people do that, they've got to realize there's consequences to that action. Conservatives encouraged Loeffner to pull the trigger. Sarah Palin, Michelle Bachman, Fox News, all spurred the psychopath. I'm back is problematic. He's crazy. I even need to tell you what MSNBC said. To his credit, on his website, Glenn Beck today said of the killings in Arizona, quote, we must stand together against all violence. Never mind that guy over there on the left packing heat. Hint. They think Fox actually pulled the trigger. You're way beyond free speech. It's trash. It's grotesque. I want to separate the garbage from the facts. Because if this network doesn't do it and this show doesn't do it, who will? Those refusing to acknowledge the role that politics plays in loading the guns of madmen, insisting that politics have no part in this discussion, attacking the Arizona sheriff who made the obvious point that politics is inextricable. I am angry. I'm tired of it. I had nothing to do with this. An opportunity to move beyond polarization is short-lived. And after the news headlines are reset, the urgency of the Gifford story fades. And soon, it's business as usual in Washington. Deal or default, what's it going to be? U.S. Senators are on the job. The high-stakes standoff over raising the nation's debt ceiling has lawmakers working this very hour. Well, there was quite a bit of pessimism up here that they were just still at a stalemate and that they were not moving anywhere. After months of delay, the debt ceiling deadline is now unavoidable for Congress. President Obama calls House and Senate leaders to the White House to negotiate. In the spirit of compromise, the president offers a deal that includes broad and deep spending cuts. Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid are now on the table for the first time. In exchange, the president wants to end tax breaks for America's wealthiest and close corporate tax loopholes. The offer is being framed as the grand bargain. But hard right conservatives don't allow tax increases of any kind to be part of the conversation. And when news gets out that the president is willing to look at cuts for social programs, Democrats push back. No cuts in benefits for Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security beneficiaries. The debt deadline is now a little more than a day away. We are on the eve of default on the U.S. government obligations. That would occur tomorrow. So the question is, can we pass a debt limit extension today 
and the plan that has been negotiated by the president and the leaders of the House and the Senate, Republicans and Democrats. This one's going to be a real long one. Um, I think it's important we get this deal done before the markets open tomorrow morning at 9.30 in the United States. So you're, right now that's about uh, 22 hours. I, I think we're going to be working constantly in that period. we got to remove that specter of default. Hopefully give a little bit of confidence to the American people and uh, the business community that we're not all totally crazy. The frustration plays out on the House floor. So many of my colleagues have said that it was necessary to storm the White House and take the country hostage in the name of their grandchildren. The American people are sick of these kind of conversations. I want head start for my grandchildren. I want clean air and clean water for them. Here we are on the verge of, of a financial meltdown and my friends on the other side of the aisle are worried about politics. We should never have gotten to the point where our troops in Afghanistan had to ask whether they were going to be paid. That's a scandal. Later Reid and President Obama are all that stands between the American people and a responsible resolution to this debt crisis. I want my grandchildren to get the American dream, and I yield back. With the time for debate expired, the House vote would be a defining moment for the country. But the vote itself is eclipsed in a profound moment that no one anticipates. Congresswoman Gabby Giffords returns to the House with her vote in support of the bill, and a strong and gentle reminder of the importance of civility and compromise. She brought the House down. Uh, the bill is passed and without objection. A motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Nobody likes this, which I guess could be the definition of compromise. The Republican-controlled House passes a bill with deep spending cuts, including cuts in Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. In less than 24 hours, the debate moves to the Democratic-led Senate. That's a, a big question of where are Republicans going to stand on this? Um, are they going to endorse it and, and what, what their issues are with it? Majority Leader Harry Reid introduces a Senate version of the bill that cuts spending by almost $1 trillion. Funding for Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid remain intact. Corporations and America's wealthiest keep their tax breaks. An important day here in Washington, D.C. Uh, the uh, nation's debt ceiling is about to be raised. The Senate has passed it to vote 74 in favor. This agreement cuts the deficit by a trillion dollars and lays the groundwork for much more in the near future. With less than 12 hours to the midnight deadline, the Senate passes the Budget Control Act of 2011 and President Obama signs it into law shortly after. Across the Hill and across the country, an exhausted sigh of relief is accompanied by a profound sense of disappointment. The debt ceiling deadline passes with no notice. Life in America goes on. But polls show that only 17% of Americans are satisfied with Congress's performance. It is an historical low point. The following week, Standard & Poor's downgrades America's credit rating. They say their decision is based on the extreme dysfunction in Congress and its inability to accomplish anything meaningful. We've come to a pretty sad state of affairs, though, when it's a good day when the country didn't default. And I think what we've seen here is we've seen a fix, but not a solution. It was, it was bipartisan. <laughs> um, they should have done a lot more. You can't look at the way Congress has performed over the last week, weeks, months, and not feel a certain amount of anger. And so a lot of that anger is, is justified. Until you get both sides saying that both sides really stink 
and I'm just not going to vote. And until people get, until politicians get the message that the American electorate is just dissatisfied, disillusioned, and disheartened, then nothing is going to change. As elections near, Republicans and Democrats will spend more money than they ever have trying to win votes. And with no restrictions, anonymous special interest groups will spend more money than they ever have. Under the immense pressure where money equals free speech, coupled with stubborn ideology where compromise is not an option, the American system of government cannot succeed, no matter who is elected into power. Can anything be done to turn this around? Some Americans think so. I think there's too much anger. Things are so incredibly polarized. Like, I just feel like people are almost going backwards. And folks just aren't listening to each other. There's a whole group of people that just don't want to talk at all let alone talk in a friendly way. And I think that there's a lot of Americans who are just being left behind. Hello, America! The usual silent majority is starting to make some noise. The event that brought a quarter of a million people out on this day was not a rally held by citizen activists. It was held by a couple of comedians. Stephen, FDR once said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Yes, but just 12 years later, he was dead. <laughs> was it murder? We'll never know. Americans have had a love affair with satirists through history. Mark Twain, Will Rogers, even Bob Hope, all brought their sharp wit to make political commentary. John Stewart and Stephen Colbert are filling those shoes with intellectual snipes at politicians, the media, and American culture. Their comedy is often left-leaning, but not always. Unleash the media. The left believes Americans are stupid. Republicans lie. You cannot be a liberal and a Christian. We have a village idiot in this country. It's called fundamentalist Christianity. You know what our real problem is? A country full of Joe the Plumbers. Crazed teabaggers. Gun nuts. Tree huggers. Yahoos and birthers. Fabian socialists. Crazies, let's say. They are what's wrong with America. I win again! The theme for their rally was to restore sanity, tone down the rhetoric, agree to disagree. We hear every damn day about how fragile our country is on the brink of catastrophe, torn by polarizing hate, and how it's a shame that we can't work together to get things done. But the truth is, we do. We work together to get things done every damn day. I go back to listening, and I think that's grounded in respect for each other. Well, I think it's what makes a good jury person is that you can actually uh, sit there and listen. I don't really care what people think or do anything. It's just if they can talk about it. I think not only can we do it, not only do we have to do it, but people need to start setting an example. This is actually how you live, walk the talk. Sometimes it's good to be challenged, to hear, again, something logical and laid out that's counter. I mean, it's not all, you know, one way or the other. By being informed, dialogue is not so difficult. At the end of the day, I really feel that America is populated by a bunch of people who all want what's right for them and really would like to help each other. But we're not sure how to do that, and we need the leadership to get us there. At least one leader has taken that cue. Former Oklahoma Congressman Mickey Edwards has been studying the issue since he left Congress and has ideas about how to correct the system from the inside out. In an article in The Atlantic, Edwards spells out specific changes to the American system of government that would level the playing field for all politicians and bring a more transparent system to the people. Number one, I do think citizens need to be much more engaged. When a congressman has a town meeting, they need to go to it. Uh, they, they need to... Uh, go to his office or her office. Uh, they need to express themselves about what's on their minds and, and hopefully in an intelligent manner. But it's also the job of the legislator to listen. 
to take the initiative. My good friend Gabby Giffords, when she was shot, was doing what? She was having a town meeting with her constituents to hear their views. And so you had two, two good sides. You had Gabby doing what she should have done as a legislator, and you had people who came to the thing, you know, to talk to their member of Congress. Uh, and that's what it takes. It's a, two, it's a two-way street, a dialogue. You have to be informed. You know, don't just watch American Idol. You know, watch, you know, watch the news, you know, try to read a variety of different sources so you're not just getting Glenn Beck in one ear and, and Rush Limbaugh in the other ear. It shouldn't cost what it costs to run for office. My own feeling is that only human beings ought to be able to give to a campaign. You know, no corporations, no labor unions, no political action committees, you know, that, that only individual living human beings ought to be able to contribute to a campaign. Money going into the system without you knowing where it's coming from is really a dangerous idea in a democracy. One of the things that we always had when, when I was running, if you gave me money for my campaign, I knew it, and so did everybody else in America, because the Federal Election Commission had that. And we not only knew that you gave, we knew how much you gave, we knew when you gave it. It's either the left-wing zealots or the right-wing zealots who vote in the primaries, causing people to get elected who don't represent the bulk of the population. The answer to that, and the, the state of California just adopted this, Washington state has done it, is to say we're gonna have open primaries where every single person who wants to run for the U.S. Senate from California uh, is on one ballot. The choice of, of where those district lines will be and therefore who, who's going to get elected, what kind of a person is going to get elected, is left to the parties because it's done in the state legislature and it's controlled by whichever party has the majority in the state legislature. You could say, I want districts that are competitive so that you have, whatever party you're in, you have a chance to win. It's a competitive district. Or, you, or one that is um, one where you have a commonality of interest. So you try to draw the, the uh, district so that all the wheat farmers will have their voice. We really need to get past this idea that we owe our fealty to a party or a party leader or a party spokesman. Nancy Pelosi, which is Speaker of the House, my job is to elect more Democrats. I didn't know that was the job of the Speaker of the House. You know, Mitch McConnell, as the Republican leader of the Senate, my job is to defeat Barack Obama. Yeah, I didn't know that was his job. You should make your decisions on every single issue, on the merits of the issue. The leader of their party can't kick you out of Congress. They can't take away your office. They can't take away your parking space. They can't take away your staff. You know, just tell them to stick it. Another kind of leader has called for change in Congress. Howard Schultz, the CEO of Starbucks, made a pledge to withhold campaign contributions to any member of Congress until they move beyond partisan gridlock. He got over 120 other CEOs to do the same. In a New York Times full-page ad, Schultz spelled out his grievances in detail and encouraged people to get involved and make their voices heard. But not everyone has that kind of influence to make an individual difference. But there is strength in numbers. In Washington, D.C., middle ground volunteers are becoming active. No Labels is an organization that pushes members of Congress towards the common ground on issues. Uh, so that's the kind of hope is to identify these state leaders on the grassroots level, uh, you know, 435 congressional districts in, in 2011. Uh, they can really speak to the movement and continue to build the movement. They've set up offices in all 435 districts across the country. I think that we see both sides grinding their heels in, which is resulting in tremendous gridlock. And when we have that, we don't have solutions to problems. 
And we're at the end of procrastination. We can't avoid these situations any longer. You know, for a long time it was okay to say, ah, two more years, we'll get you. My party will take it back over. Great, fine, let them have control. Let them fail for two years. But failure for one side or the other right now is failure for both sides. We are the mainstream of America. We represent the sensible center and the majority in the middle. Our displeasure is not based on a particular party or person. After all, there's plenty of blame to pass around. Our concern is based upon a system that focuses too much on politics and not enough on progress. No Labels has gotten traction by working directly with some members of Congress. No Labels message to every congressional district. Congressman Jim Cooper sees this relationship as an opportunity. Together, they've come up with a list of reforms that would change the way Congress does business. In terms of real reform of Congress, it really all boils down to two remarkably simple and common sense ideas. It all boils down to civility, getting along with your neighbor, and also knowledge. You have to know what you're talking about. The reforms include pay for performance. If members of Congress can't work together and come up with a budget, then they won't get paid themselves. A longer work week for Congress, instead of the current three-day week. A monthly question and answer period between the President and members of Congress, similar to the British Parliament. Monthly bipartisan gatherings. They would give members on both sides of the aisle the opportunity to establish solid working and personal relationships. Reform the Senate filibuster rules, and instead return to the old filibuster rules, where senators had to continuously speak on the floor for hours. Currently, a senator can simply file a document to block a bill. Impose reasonable time limits on the appointment process for the president's staff, so the White House is not held back from political maneuvering. All these problems are fixable. These are what people call high-class problems because they're the problems, if you have to have a problem, these are the problems you want to have because they are so easily fixable. But we have to have the will to do it. Today, there is a growing trend towards correcting hyperpartisanship in the country's political dialogue. Welcome to Americans Elect. For the first time, the American people are choosing a leader that works for us, not just the parties and their special interests. Like any experiment, some efforts will see success, while other ideas won't go as far in the current political climate. Americans for Campaign Reform is a group advocating for public campaign funding. The idea gives qualified candidates public funding to spend on their election efforts. By allowing only small donations from individuals, public financing would limit the influence of big money on campaigns. The notion is that without the overwhelming pressure to constantly raise money, politicians and candidates would be able to spend more time and effort addressing the issues instead of fundraising. Ruckus, or R-U-C-K dot U-S, is another web-based political gathering place. Ruckus matches users to other users with similar political priorities and suggestions on how to become involved on any given issue. Vote411.org is a site created by the League of Women Voters. It collects information directly from each voting district and gives voters that information about the candidates and issues in their area. And they help voters with important dates, voter eligibility, it even helps voters find their polling places. Would you all please uh, raise your right hands? Do you solemnly swear that you will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic? When we take the time to understand the problems that hold our democracy back, we can change our direction. If we have the will, and if we elect representatives, to provide the leadership. America is a country of choices. Americans can choose to move beyond hyperpartisanship and polarization. In a Washington Post editorial, Fareed Zakaria wrote, We are not condemned to have a political system whose chief characteristics are venom, dysfunction, and paralysis. The attempts to pull Americans to the radical right or left will always be there. 
baiting us with fear and emotion. But it may be Abraham Lincoln who said it best. Let the people know the facts, and the country will be safe. What really matters is leaving the country better off than we found it. Uh, th that's really what this is about. There's a lot of right-wing, left-wing purists, and they, 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 you can only stamp them out with common sense. Uh, and don't let them use emotion, fear, guilt, or racism on you. I always say, don't use that crap on me. Use facts. You can't have a democracy without accurate, independently gathered information. Uh, that's as crucial to a democracy as, as voting. We are, we are going to have to make hard decisions, and we're going to have to rise to the level of full citizens rather than being clients of the state or rather than being driven in our fears by people on these shows that we think are telling us facts, but they're really just entertaining us. If they could just remember that those people are entertainers, they couldn't govern their way out of a paper sack. The idea is that this society uh, and the rules it lives by and, and the laws we, we live under are supposed to be decided by you. Uh, and if you remain out of it, you, you don't participate in elections, you don't vote, you allow people who have different views than yours to dominate. The system that our forefathers devised, it's genius. And uh, we've got to respect our system and recognize, you know, we, we are the shining city on the hill. And we've got to live up to that reputation and that ideal and that history. Well, this is the greatest country on earth. And, and we forget that. We forget who we are. Many people of a generation before us accuse us of being apathetic, of not caring. Yeah. We just need a cause that we can believe in, and that is not far right or far left. Yeah. Sometimes it's right down the middle. The founders had a tremendous faith, and it's really propelled this country, uh, that if we just talked to each other enough, even sometimes shouted at each other, we didn't kill each other. Uh, but if we talk to each other, we would come up with the right solution. And that seems to have worked throughout the nation's history. I remember during one of the debates around here, one of my colleagues had a little card in front of him that said, don't rise to the bait. Don't rise to the bait. What he meant by that was when people are trying to evoke an emotional response from you, don't just fall for it. Take a deep breath, be calm, think it over before you respond. And I think we could all use that. That's good advice for all of us, me included. I do want things to work and I do want, I mean, I love, look, I live and breathe politics, but at the same time I want, you know, our lives to be improved in, in whatever way is possible. And you can't do it by yelling at each other. The country is very resilient uh, and its people are resilient. And, and we do have this, this ability, when the chips are down, when we're backed against the wall, uh, to find a way out of it. I, ju I just hope we can always do that, uh, because if we don't, uh, we're in for some hard times. The fact is that the American people will get the quality of politics and the quality of politicians they demand. And if we leave this to the activists on the right or even on the left alone, then we're going to have more of the same.